Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today we're going to talk about the only sailor killed on board Battleship New Jersey in combat in all of the ship's service. So, as uh, many longtime viewers know, Battleship New Jersey fought through World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Lebanese Civil War. She was in the Persian Gulf during the Iran-Iraq War, and of course participated in the Cold War, which didn't involve too much actual fighting. So, uh, Battleship New Jersey was no stranger to war, uh, and the ship was always cram-packed with sailors, as little as 1,600 at the end of her career, but as many as 2,800 during World War II. Yet, throughout the ship's entire career, only one sailor was killed on board in combat. His name was Seaman Robert Herman Osterwin of Detroit, Michigan. He served on board the ship during her first Korean War deployment in 1951. He was in 7th Division, which manned the port side 40 millimeter gun, uh, and he was killed basically in the ship's first day of the war. So, the four Iowa class battleships were largely decommissioned following World War II. Battleship Missouri was kept in commission. So, when the Korean War started, Missouri was sent out first. The other Iowas were reactivated to replace her, and uh, in May of 1951, Battleship New Jersey goes over and relieves Missouri. After doing some administrative stuff on May 20th, 1951, New Jersey is deployed to um, the area around Wonsan Harbor, which was a major Korean supply base. There, there were a lot of roads and railroad tracks come uh, to the harbor and the areas around it. And it's a fairly big harbor, so the ship has to sail around a bit to engage all these targets. The nights before, I knew this Robert Osterwind uh... Uh, uh, as a shipmate, not as a friend, because uh, and I knew him mainly because I met him and he was from Detroit and I live in Ohio, uh, a matter of a hundred miles from where I live where he lived. And that's why there was a little bit of a, let's talk about it. And uh, probably, I don't know what night it was before, I don't, we was at General Quarters for a couple of days there, I know, or one day. But one of the nights before we are, had liberty to go below decks, not on the main deck. Uh, and he was playing cards. We played cards. It was about four or five of us playing poker using matchsticks. We had a value on the match stick, uh, 10 cents or whatever it was. And at the end of the, the game, whoever had your match, you, I don't know whether, I forget how we regulated that. You wrote down in your book who you owed from that night of uh, poker or that little session. And you had it, I got, in fact, I still got the book at home, little little pocket thing there. And uh, he was playing cards with us uh, and uh, two or three other guys from our, my division. And, and, and uh, I probably shouldn't even talk about this. Matter of fact, when that game got done, I owed Robert Osterwind, I had 10 match chicks he had of mine. I owed him like $2, maybe two bucks, two seventy. Uh, in my book, I got it in there, and uh, of course the next morning or two mornings later, he's dead. By the morning of the 21st, the battleship was at anchor in Wonsan Harbor. Uh, some of the crew members seem to have been at their uh, general quarters stations. For example, the gun crews were all in place. We was at general quarters for all day and all night at least firing. Everybody at their battle stations, they brought you the food and the little Ten containers to your battle station, and uh, that morning they announced we were going to go to condition three, which is one condition manning the guns and doing the introductory firing, they called it, at factories, rail yards, troop movements, whatever. Uh, and so, and uh, two other uh, condition, the two other ones on condition three were off duty to do their cleanup, the, whatever work they had to do. Uh, uh, and uh, then go to breakfast. But uh, it does not seem like the ship was at general quarters. 9.30 in the morning, sailors began observing splashes walking towards the ship. And this is a common thing uh, with artillery, particularly smaller fast firing artillery batteries, uh, is you fire ranging shots and then start walking them towards your target until you can get a hit on the target. At approximately 9.32, a shell hit the faceplate of turret number one, 
which I believe was rotated about 90 degrees for a firing mission. The shell broke up on contact. Men inside the turret uh, say that they didn't even hear the explosion or know they were hit. There was a man looking through the periscope and uh, all of a sudden the periscope went black. A shell fragment had knocked out the, the sight glass. It had also damaged this ladder here on the port side and the uh, shell handling davit that hangs just above the ladder. You can see that in pictures. Upon receiving damage, approximately 932, the ship goes to general quarters. At that point, any sailors who had been on duty all night for shore bombardment missions, who had been sleeping down below, roll out of their racks, throw on life jackets and M1 helmets, and start running up ladders. Ladders such as this one right next to us. Many of the deck and weapons division sailors lived in these forward berthing spaces. A group of these sailors from Division 7 were headed to the 40 millimeter gun mount forward here on the port side. Unlike the other IO class battleships, New Jersey still has the remnants of the gun tub here so you can see where it was. Before those sailors could make it into the protection of this screen, a near miss from the Korean battery hit the water and exploded, sending shrapnels up onto the ship. When that happened, Seaman Apprentice Chenille uh, was hit, fracturing his left tibia. Fire Controlman Surface Warfare Third Class Van Fleet was hit and fractured his fourth, fifth, and sixth ribs. Seaman Desicon. Uh, was hit with shrapnel that penetrated his left arm. And Seaman Robert Osterwin uh, was hit in the chest. Uh, a shell fragment went through his KPOC life jacket and into his chest. Hospital corpsmen were summoned. And by the time they got here, uh, they found Osterwin had already expired. And all four sailors were carried to the battle dressing station in the wardroom. I'm laying there and I'm watching them. Come on, let's hurry up, get down there. And these guys are just going, and these guys are actually trying to trying to squeeze and just like popping through. And, and I finally got to it, but during this interim, he says, let's run back and get in that, go in that loading hatch. And I said, no, I said, it's better stay here. And all of a sudden he jumped up, started running back down there. That's well, from there, it's probably 40 feet, 50 feet. Yeah, 50 feet. And then that next burst, the next shell, I heard it go over. I heard it whine and whistle like they do in a little roar, train deal. They were eight inch shells, they said. And that, that had a, above, the, above the water explosion. And then I heard the shrapnel come back and hitting it. It got him two or three places in his leg. In fact, I, she showed me a chunk next day or next two days. And that's the one that got uh, Osterwin. He was on that side of the ship and he was going up the ladder to go to 01 level to get up to the turret. And he had, and this is exactly how I interpreted it. He's reaching up on that rope, what we had there, the chain, and that chunk just come in here and. During general quarters, the armored hatch leading down to third deck where the hospital is, the ship's sick bay, is closed. So you can't transport people down there. So there are battle dressing stations manned by hospital corpsmen uh, throughout the ship for if you take casualties. And they act as triage centers prior to moving patients down below. So at the battle dressing station in the wardroom, Seaman Osterwind would have been pronounced dead. And his three uh, division mates would have been tended to prior to being admitted to the sick list. The wardroom is configured a little bit differently now in her 80s configuration than it would have been during the Korean War. All of the tables would have been going uh, across the width of the ship as opposed to this one which is going oriented fore and aft. It's tradition on Navy ships to always, if you're on duty, you leave your cover on, it's part of the uniform, but if you're off duty to uncover yourself when you're in any sort of mess space, that's because these spaces have tables and they always serve as battle dressing stations. Uh, it, it's real easy to bring a wounded sailor in and lay him on the table here so that you can 
uh, perform medical work. Otherwise, what would you use a space like this for in combat? Further evidence of this is the surgical lamp overhead, and in case you lose power while performing some sort of uh, operation, you've also got four battle lanterns around, which are battery backups. So the other uh, three sailors would have all been laid out on tables like these, and they would have received medical treatment in here prior to going down to sick bay. And we were up in Juan San, and Juan San had some guns over on the beach, and they opened fire on us, and they hit the number two target. target. And so I turned to the captain and said he wanted general, uh, like have general quarters, and that's man your battle stations. And so we sounded general quarters, and this young man was doing everything correct. He was approaching his battleship on the disengaged side, and some shell went over the ship and exploded, and the shrapnel hit him. Upon receiving damage, Battleship New Jersey slipped her anchor chain. They just disconnected the chain so that the whole thing would drop off and uh, she already had steam up in at least four boilers, so the ship began to get underway. Normally, you would try to maneuver the ship to fire your guns broadside. However, they didn't wait for that. They did what was called an over-the-shoulder shoot. The 16-inch guns have uh, a very broad angles of fire, and the superstructure is specifically designed the way it is to give them the best angles of fire so that the, the forward turrets can fire pretty far aft and the aft turrets can fire pretty, for, for, pretty far forward. In this case, the forward turrets were uh, trained kind of forward, so they were firing over the main deck where they wouldn't normally, but the aft turret had to train up close to the aft superstructure. The concussion and overpressure from that gun going off damaged the splinter shield that protected the 40 millimeter gun. It also damaged some fittings in the superstructure. At approximately noon that day, having destroyed the North Korean position and completed the firing mission, the crew did a battle damage assessment. The report reads as follows. Splinter shield for 40 millimeter mount number 17, which is this one. It's badly buckled by blast damage. Watertight door number 141, which is against the aft superstructure there, also buckled from blast damage. The forward ammunition boom uh, for turret number one was demolished. That's the arm that hangs out over the turret near the ladder. The after ammunition handling boom on turret one was also damaged. All of the bucklers, the, the rubber pieces on the uh, breech side of the gun where it goes through the, uh, the faceplate were shredded by the uh, shell fragmentation. The port inclined access ladder on turret one was damaged. And if you look at it today, you can see where they cut off the old one and welded a brand new one on right next to it. Uh, the two floater storage baskets, which are nets that have uh, cork floater rings around them that were stored in baskets along the superstructure. So if the ship sank, they would float free and the crew could climb inside. Uh, they were shredded by damage. You can see that in the pictures. Uh, two sections of wood decking forward of the turret were split and gouged by shell fragmentation. Uh, the glass port and periscope number one for the turret was shattered. Two 20 millimeter submersion tubes for ones at the uh, 20 millimeter guns forward of the 40 millimeter guns on the bow uh, were sheared off of their brackets. Several machine screws were blown out of the cover plates for the anchor windlasses and capstans. Uh, the screen on the vent supply trunk on the O1 level was blown off the shore steam line connection at frame 135 back here uh, was blown off by the overpressure from the guns. And uh, fiberglass insulation was blown off of a couple places inside the superstructure. So the battleship received more damage from the overpressure of her own guns than she did from the shell hit, which her armor was able to defeat. After receiving this damage, Battleship New Jersey would go on to spend another several months in Korean waters before being replaced by Iowa later Wisconsin and Missouri. Uh, and then in 1953, New Jersey returned to the uh, Korean coast, this time as the flagship of Admiral Jocko Clark and 7th Fleet. 
she would be off the coast of Korea when the armistice was declared. If you're interested in learning more about our Korean War deployment and our 1950s history in general, we're going to be opening a new exhibit on the battleship service during that time period, probably next month, probably around June of uh, 2021. And on June 26th, 2021, we're going to be uh, holding our Korean War Living History Day, where we'll have uh, reenactors and exhibitors displaying objects and uniforms from the Korean War period on board. Feel free to join us that day. Is the Korean War really the Forgotten War? Have you studied it in school before? Let us know in the comment section down below. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State and from other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. In particular, the support from viewers like you have allowed us to go from making one video a week to making multiple videos a week uh, and, and making the channel a larger part of our jobs here. If you would like to continue to support us, there's a link in the description below where you can donate. And also remember to like, share, and subscribe so that you're notified when all of these new videos go live. Thanks for watching.